The Atheist of Ace Patreon Project presents Curry's Paradox. Is logic unreliable? Yes, it is. Thank you so much for tuning in. This has been the end of my... No. Uh, we'll, we'll get to the answer to that question. Just for clarity, I'm not going to be going through Curry's Paradox in great detail. First of all, I'm, I, I don't have the requisite expertise to properly teach it, and there are so many others who do, and it's really easy to dig in. Instead, I'm going to be working through a number of my original Foundation Series videos, um, kind of like Logic 101 things, to try to inspire people to care more about philosophy and understanding logic, uh, what its limitations are, and how to think in terms of is there a fallacy, is there a paradox, etc. To learn more about Curry's paradox specifically, and I'm going to give a rough kind of one-off explanation here. You can go verify everything I've said at either the Stanford University uh, Encyclopedia on Philosophy, which I highly recommend for any questions about philosophical issues, but also you can go to YouTube and watch videos from like Kane B, who was recently a guest on one of my shows. He's got a video on Curry's Paradox. There are several others that are somewhat shorter uh, and rely on more or less understanding. I almost didn't even call this video Curry's Paradox at all, um, because what we're going to be starting with is without any graphs, no logical uh, specific languages or symbols or anything that would be confusing, just common language, I'm going to describe a couple of logical principles. No graphics on the screen. It may be a mistake. You may, be, you may benefit from this. And if so, then we'll do some you know set theory-based kind of graphics for later. But the first thing is to understand modus ponens, which is a logical inference that just says, if P then Q, P, therefore Q. And you can, P and Q are just letters to put there. If the, you know, if this is happening, then this is happening. Or if this happened, then this happened, this happened, this happened. It's confusing, I guess, with this. So let's replace those P's and Q's with, if it's the last day of the month, then Matt is working. It is the last day of the month, therefore Matt is working. That is just a straightforward, simple, one of the most referenced and useful logical inferences out there. If something is true, this implies something else is true as well. There's nothing remotely challenging or problematic about modus ponens. It's related to a logical inference called modus tollens which is essentially, uh, if P then Q, not Q, then not P. And all that is is a transposition, because if P then Q is being transposed to, if not Q, then not P. And you can demonstrate that both of these are uh, true and, and valid in form uh, using truth tables. And you could reword this from, if it's the last day of the month, then Matt is working, to if Matt is not working, it is not the last day of the month. Matt is not working, therefore it's not the last day of the month. Modus ponens, modus tollens, nothing controversial about that really. That transposition is logically valid and you can demonstrate it by looking at truth tables. There are though invalid transpositions. Two in particular I'll, I'll talk about real quickly. One is called affirming the consequent. So if you have if P then Q, Q is the consequent. And it'd be like, if it's the last day of the month, then Matt is working. And if you were to say, Matt is working, you're affirming the consequent, then you could say, therefore, it's the last day of the month, except that's not true. That's why this is an invalid structure. It is a fallacy. Because if it's the last day of the month and Matt is working, Matt's working, therefore it's the last day of the month, uh, is wrong because I might also work on other days throughout the month. Similarly, uh, you also have denying the antecedent, which is if P then Q, not P, therefore not Q. And that's also invalid because you could say, if it's the last day of the month, then Matt is working. It is not the last day of the month, therefore Matt is not working. But that's not necessarily true because I might be working on some other day of the month. Uh, the way to resolve both of these, by the way, is to change the if to if and only if. 
Because then if you say, if and only if it's the last day of the month, then Matt is working, then if Matt's working, then it must be the last day of the month, becomes valid. So this is the difference where you want to have, you know, if this is true, then this other thing is true. And this other thing is true only under the circumstance that this is true. It's a distinction. I remember uh, in, in my early logic classes in the uh in Navy, Naval Nuclear Power Program, which was basically about logic gates, and you had AND gates and OR gates and exclusive OR gates and NAND gates and all of these things here. Doing the truth tables for these is a really good idea. I just didn't want to put truth tables up on the screen and logical notation that might potentially confuse people. But most ponens, most tolens, fairly standard. So what is a curry sentence? It is, for the purposes of this paradox, a sentence that is self-referential, which ties the truth of that sentence to some conclusion. So you could say something like, if this sentence is true, then Matt is working. And that's just modus ponens again. If this, then that. If this sentence is true, then Matt is working. This sentence is true, therefore Matt is working. Nothing about that is, is problematic. It may be the case that those two things aren't tied together. Like whether or not this sentence is true has no impact at all on whether or not I'm working. But from a logical structure, if you say, if this sentence is true, then Matt is working. This sentence is true, therefore Matt is working. That is just modus ponens. If P then Q, P therefore Q. The problem is that you can replace the words this sentence with that whole sentence. And then this would be a little hard to follow, but it becomes if, if the sentence is true, Matt is working, is true, then Matt is working. That's just simply substituting the sentence, the Curry sentence we're talking about, the self-referential sentence, into the actual sentence in, replace for, in replacement of, of the words of this sentence. And there's nothing wrong with that either. And so then you get, if P then Q, or P implies Q, or if the sentence is true, then Matt is working, implies that if it's true, Matt is working. And then if Q implies R, then you can condense all that to P implies R, which is just a process of looking at um, identity and substitution within logical arguments. And because of all this, you basically get to, if this sentence is true, then Matt is working, proves Matt is working, except it doesn't. It can't. How can the mere truth of a sentence prove that I'm working? I am working, but that doesn't seem to be tied to whether or not the sentence is true. And because it's, you know, we're looking at it right now, that sentence, when you read it, if that sentence is true, would only apply right now when I'm reading it. It doesn't apply when you read it. Ooh, that's a problem that we didn't even get into in the uh, initial discussions about uh, about this on the, the Stanford thing. And that's because there's just this assumption that it applies as the, the statement is saying. It's like saying, uh, you know, if I'm awake, I'm hungry. And I'm awake, so I'm hungry. And if I'm not awake, I may or may not be hungry. You can't tell. But if I'm awake, I'm definitely hungry. So the thing about Curry sentences is because they're self-referential, you can do this little substituted in place. You're not violating any laws of logic or anything else. And you can then use the proposition itself to basically declare the conclusion. And the problem with that is, well, if this sentence is true, then Matt is working. And if this sentence is true, Matt is not working, are logically identical. And so how can a sentence a statement, demonstrate that I am in fact working and also demonstrate that I am not in fact working. It seems that many of the paradoxes in logic fall into a particular bucket of self-referential statements. Um, things like the liar's paradox, this statement is false. And it, it seems like we're, we're kind of stuck. Oh my gosh, we've got this statement is false, it's liar's paradox, it's self-referential. Curry's paradox, if this sentence is true, then the earth is flat. Maybe the solution is just to eliminate all self-referential uh, statements within logic. Um, 
I think that comes with its own problems as well, but I'm not here to resolve all that. And I'm not even here to, to pretend that any of us can resolve Curry's paradox. There are a number of different proposed solutions to this, and it may be one of the biggest problems uh, in logic. So to, get, to answer the question that is the whole purpose of this video, does this mean that logic isn't reliable? No. And here's the good news. We can identify where things go wrong, just as we could when we were evaluating syllogistic forms, when Aristotle and his band of merry logicians determined all possible uh, syllogistic forms and, and concluded these 256 syllogistic forms are valid, which means that true premises lead to true conclusions reliably. Um, we also are able to identify uh, invalid structures. We are able to identify... Uh, problems with soundness in arguments, and we can identify paradoxes. And so we might rely on something and then find we've relied on it uh, without warrant or with more confidence than we should have relied on it because it leads to some paradox. That's, that's kind of what we're dealing with here with Curry sentences. But the fact that we're able to find those things and identify them, even though we're not necessarily able to resolve them and say what would fix them or what we might need to change about logic uh, or our understanding of logic, that's separate. Logic is still reliable. It is the fact that we're able to identify these problems that further confirms its reliability. By identifying where it's not reliable increases the overall uh, reliability as opposed to its, its, its fallibility. And it's like saying, hey, if there's 23 rulers in this room and we want to know which ones of them are accurate, we can hold two rulers up against each other and that would tell us, hey, are these the same or are these different? But it wouldn't tell us which one was right. We may not be able to tell which ones are right, but if we find out that all of them except one are the same, well, then now we're in a binary situation where either one of them is wrong or the others are all wrong. And we may not know which one's which, but if, if, if the one continues to produce reliable results versus the 22 others continue to re produce reliable results, that is a good indicator of what we can rely on. This gets down to issues of foundationalism versus coherentism and everything. But the other question or the other issue that it raises for us is that means we need to be diligent about the structure of arguments. Most of the time we're having arguments in conversational form. We're having public debates where we say something or we cite some information and we have some sort of implied argument or we might have a loosely structured argument that is based on something that may not actually be true and it may not even be valid in structure. But other times you'll see arguments and, and debates where somebody puts if P, then Q, and this, and, and a bunch of stuff on the, on the screen, and we lose the audience, which is why I wanted to try and see if people could understand this without having that stuff on the screen. Because in debates and conversations where we want to talk about logical reasoning at a level that maybe the average person in the public isn't familiar with, they're perfectly capable of understanding if this stuff had been explained, but we just go in and it's like, if P then Q, P therefore Q, A equals A, A implies B, B implies C, therefore A implies C. We do these things, and it's like speaking a language where you're assuming that the audience is on board. And I have no problem with producing content like that where people can go out and do the research. Um, Dawkins was once called out for using... Uh, Comp, uh, jargonish and and um, field specific language that the average public couldn't understand. And somebody was like, "You you should speak in a more uh, common, plain spoken way." And his reply was, "No, they can go look it up." And and that's fine if you're trying to encourage ed education. But if you're trying to encourage understanding, that may not be the best approach. I'm fine with both of them. It just depends on what your goal is, but. Logicians are basically diligent about the structure of arguments and language and, and making it as clear as possible, but it takes a lot of time to get to where you can understand how to even read those things. How to figure out, do we have a hidden equivocation fallacy somewhere? Is, you know, is this P the same as this P? If P then Q, there, if 
and then you assert P. Um, but another thing to look for is triviality. And this will help with things like the Ravens paradox that we talked about a little bit about before may fall under this notion of triviality and definitely with things like a Curry sentence. In logic, triviality is whenever a statement can demonstrate anything. When you say, if this sentence is true, then the earth is flat. That's not the same sentence as if, if the sentence is true, the earth is flat, it is true, then the earth is flat. There's a slight difference there. What is it that's being called true? The first sentence or the first sentence that refers to itself? If we merely declare the, cost, the conditional is true because we can make a self-referential state be equivalent to itself, what do we accomplished? But an argument is trivial if it can affirm every claim, and that's what happens with Curry sentences. Curry sentences are such that if the sentence is true, Matt is working. If the sentence is true, Matt's not working. If the sentence is true, God exists. If the sentence is true, God doesn't exist. If the sentence is true, the sky is pink. If the sentence is true, the sky is solid. If the sky, you know, it's not solid. Matt's working. Matt's not working. It can affirm anything. So go learn about Curry's paradox. Keep an eye out for similar tricks in logical argument. It takes time, it takes experience and practice, but you don't have to, you know, go take university level courses in logic and then understand, you know, oh, modus ponens and modus tollens. It would be nice. And it's much makes it much easier to spot fallacies like, you know, denying the antecedent and affirming the consequent. But when you're arguing, be extra diligent and pause on occasion Take time to take notes, if you can, in order to evaluate the argument's form and content. Use your downtime when you're not arguing to learn about the outliers and the curiosities, and it'll make identifying fallacies much easier, and it'll make it easier to spot things in common language arguments. You'll get a feel for it, and I'm not telling you, trust your feelings, Luke, or your feelings matter, but you'll be training your gut to more intuitively say, hang on, say that again, because I think what you said, yeah, I think what you said is a fallacy. Can we write that down? Can we draw that out and see if the syllogistic form is correct and if we all accept the premises? Look for examples of self-referential sentences in arguments and anything that seems wrong. If you're in a position where somebody's unwilling to write down, restate what they said and write it down, you're either under incredible time pressure in a public debate, in which case perhaps both of you should have uh, assessed this prior to the actual debate, or you're in some weird situation that I don't understand. Because for most of you in conversational discussions, you're not gonna run across somebody saying, oh yeah, well, here's my proof of God. If this sentence is true, God exists. You're not gonna run across that and this is understood well enough, but you might run across a hidden or disguised version of it. And if you didn't know that it existed, if you didn't know this problem was there, you might then reach the conclusion that either whatever conclusion they reached is true or that logic is wholly unreliable and should be tossed aside, neither of which is warranted. So plato.stanford.edu and a number of great videos on YouTube going through paradoxes can be really fun, even if you don't grasp them right off the bat. The more you know and understand about this, the better you're going to be at identifying fallacies when in discussion with other people. Common language, informal logic fallacies can still be grasped once you understand what the formal fallacies are. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.